This episode is all about photographing cats, big cats and little cats, but all of them wild cats. Hello, I'm your host, Kirby Flanagan, and my guest today is Sebastian Kenner Connect. Sebastian photographs lions, cheetahs, cougars, but especially wildcats, one of the most elusive species of wildlife there is. Stick around to see some great photos. Welcome, Sebastian. Thanks for having me, Kirby. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I've enjoyed looking at your photos, and uh, it's great having a chance to chat. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's nice, especially during these COVID times, to have social interaction. <laughs> yeah, very true. So you had a pretty exciting career photographing wildlife. How did you get that started? I um, so I started about fourteen years ago, um, doing it really intensely but before that I should start out by saying so photography was a hobby kind of in high school and and as I entered college I thought I was going to become a biologist studying you know studying probably the cats that I now photograph but uh, phot photography just was something I wanted to do more and more and I became really obsessed about photographing a bobcat on campus I went to UC Santa Cruz which is uh, in Northern California in the United States. And that campus has a lot of nature around it. It's kind of built into the forest. So bobcats actually are found on campus. And I just made it my mission to try and find one of these super elusive cats. I read everything about them. And I um, went out every day at sunrise, you know, before classes would start looking for these cats. And um, and then found my first bobcat, and that was kind of the beginning of the end, so to speak, of being obsessed with wildcats and photographing cats. But so that was kind of the wildcat aspect of it. The the photography aspect of it was that I, though I was studying biology, I, I wanted to see if photography was something that I could could pursue. And I was lucky enough to work for a Nat Geo photographer, Franz Lanting. He lives in Santa Cruz. So I actually just went to his studio and um, and was like, hey, do you need some free labor? Can I intern with you guys? <laughs> and what photographer, I mean, most photographers like free labor if, uh, if you're a net positive for them. And so I ended up interning for Franz for six months and then he hired me on for another two years I was lucky enough to go on two Nat Geo assignments with him. And that stint really showed me the, the power of photography, how many people I could reach with photographs that I couldn't reach with, um, you know, that I wouldn't be able to reach with a scientific paper, for example. So that was kind of the aha moment for me where I, I wanted, I knew, okay, this is what I want to do because I can reach a lot of people with photographs, especially in terms of uh conservation and uh and getting them to care about animals that they might might not know about wow well, nice way to start your photography career yeah yeah that was uh i learned a lot um working there you know not just about i would say even less so about photographs but more importantly about the business of photography and that can be such a challenge um in photography it's like we all love taking photos but how do you actually make money with it yeah exactly yeah so you mentioned a bit about how you started in cat photography. Uh, what's got you, what's kept you going over these years? Cause you've been uh, doing it all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the so like I mentioned, the Bobcat uh, obsession was kind of the beginning and, and there was a distinct moment too, where, um, you know, after I saw my first Bobcats, that was such, those were such elating moments, but what it really, was for me that a couple months after I saw my first cat, I ran into, not ran into, I, I found a, a mom and a, and a kitten um, that it was a almost fully grown kitten. The mom was just kind of finishing, uh, teaching it how to hunt before it left its mom. And so for the next three weeks, I would spend every day uh, with this mom and kitten pair and and uh, they got quite used to me and eventually they would sleep 10, 15 feet away from me. And that's, you know, such a sign of trust with, uh, with a cat when they're napping in front of you. That's really the ultimate respect in a way. 
And uh, just getting to see them and spend all this time and seeing this behavior and the interaction between kitten and mom was was the absolute clincher for me where I was like, okay, I love cats. Let me, let me uh, see what other cats I can photograph. Uh, the, the, of course, the next cat in California is the, is the mountain lion, also known as a puma or a cougar or a catamount, whatever name you want to give it. It's the same animal. And the hard part with mountain lions is that you don't see them in California. So uh, it's not like you can just, like I could do with the bobcats or just look for them every day and, you know, track them and, and learn all their ecology. Mountain lions are very elusive. So I started having to use camera traps which uh, I can talk about more later, but basically it's just a camera that uh, is triggered by motion. Um, when an animal walks by, it takes the photograph. And so uh, that's how I got my first mountain lion photograph. And then, uh, and then I started getting jobs to photograph other cats all around the world. And that's, yeah, like I said, I've been doing that for 14 years, photographing some very, very elusive cats. Yeah. I guess so, uh, how do you even find mountain lions? I mean, that can't be easy. Yeah. I mean, I feel like with wildlife photography, uh, 90% of it is just knowing your subject. It's, you know, before when I start a project, it's two, three months of just reading everything I can about that animal, about that wildcat species and understanding its ecology. What um, you know, what habitat does it prefer and what is its territory size? How many animals are within a given square with a yeah, square mileage area? How often does it need to drink? Does it, does it feed on carrion? What kind of prey does it eat? All of these things um, come together to, to form a, 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 a form a photo really of, of, or a picture of, of what this animal prefers and uh, does and and it helps you gain knowledge of either where to look for it um with the camera in hand or where to look for it with camera trap in hand and where to put a camera trap where an animal will walk by yeah uh, i've been told the same thing uh by other wildlife photographers that uh, doing the research is the uh, the most important part of the whole process mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, most, most definitely not just not just in terms of um, the actual animal, but also, you know, if if you're trying to tell a story, if you're trying to publish an article, um, you need to know what that story is before you get on the ground so you can maximize your efficiency in terms of getting those photographs. If you're doing a story on pumas in Chile and their main threat is being hunted by ranchers who do sheep farming, then you need to know, uh, you know, you need to know, okay, I need to get some shots of sheep farming. And so you need to build that into your shot list. So doing that research before means you don't get on the ground and like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you're best known for your wildcat or bobcat photography. Uh, one of the most elusive and hard to photograph animals. Uh, you must enjoy a challenge. Yeah, I mean, so there's 40 species of cat, you know, we know about leopards and lions and jaguars, but uh, there's 33 of these lesser known cats, like uh, like bobcats, Canada lynx, there's cats people probably have never heard of, like marbled cats or bay cats or, or Andean mountain cats. And the part of the reason why people haven't heard about them is because they're so elusive, they're so hard to photograph. When, um, when I was assigned to photograph the Borneo bay cat, there was not a single high resolution photo of this cat in existence. That was in 2013. And when I was doing the research that I mentioned earlier, it, um, the, the researchers that were studying this cat, they use these trail cameras, which is a lot of hunters use them. They're just a small, small or less professional version of, of my rig. And they would get one bay cat photo every 4,000, over 4,000 nights. So that's wow. like over 10 years of having camera traps out in the forest. So, and I, my assignment was for a month long. Um, so that was definitely uh, a good challenge. And like you said, Kirby, I do enjoy it. I do enjoy the challenge. I mean, I, uh, for me, the most important thing is to raise awareness about these small cats. And, and um, if I didn't enjoy the challenge, yeah, I wouldn't have even started because some of these cats are just so hard to photograph. Um, some, some, Cats have had to do multiple trips. 
I, I use, I use at least eight camera traps in the field. And obviously I'm also using blind work and, and just sitting, uh, uh, trying to, trying to find these cats, but it, it's an extreme, extreme challenge. And not only are the cats hard, but the environment can be really challenging. Like, uh, in when I was in Kyrgyzstan for snow leopards, or was in, uh, when I was in the Andes for any mountain cat, then I'm working at over 10,000 feet. My highest camera trap I've ever placed was at 15,000 feet, 500 feet. Um, that's high. And like, you're dealing with the slow oxygen levels and just being exhausted at all times. Or if you're working in the jungle, like when I worked in Borneo or Uganda, you're dealing with extreme dense jungle with lots of parasites. And I mean, I've almost been trampled by a forest elephant in, in Uganda when I was looking for the African golden cat, which is another very obscure wild cat in, in Central Africa. Yeah, I can imagine uh, trying to photograph in the jungles of Borneo has got to be pretty darn, pretty darn tough. Yeah, yeah, it's a, uh, you just have to accept that nothing ever is really dry. Uh, all you really focus on is keeping your camera equipment dry and, and you know everything else is just going to always be slightly damp. Um, but it's, a, it's an incredible, at the same time, it's, besides it being challenging, it's an incredible place where you can just feel the biodiversity around you just from the sound, you know, you're walking through the jungle and there's this constant like zzz in your ear because there's insects everywhere. And that's just that you can feel that all of this wildlife is around you. Seeing it is a whole nother story because it's so dense that oftentimes you just hear it versus seeing it, but yeah, just an incredible place. Yeah, sounds like better you than me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well let's see here let me share my screen and we'll take a look at some of your photos here how in the world did you uh get this photo yeah this was uh you know we think of pumas and in, in, or mountain lions in north america but they have the largest range out of any carnivore in the western hemisphere they range everywhere from alaska down to chile and this was taken in northern Argentina at about 11,000 feet. So this is a uh, this is also a camera trap shot. There's so I tend to use what's called an active sensor, which is a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter sends an infrared beam to uh, the the receiver, and when that beam is broken, the the receiver tells the camera to take a photograph. So there's two flashes on in this shot as well. You can see the beam, the boxes that transmit the beam are behind the two bushes that the mountain lion is walking through. So you can't see them in the photograph. That's always really important to hide those. And so it's it's just tripping the camera by crossing that beam right there. And um, it turns around because it hears the click of the camera. So this is a shot number like two or three within the sequence. I tend to take five or six as a burst mode. And the two flashes are illuminating this, this puma while I underexpose the, I tend to always underexpose the background a little bit um, and letting the flashes do the most of the work for the foreground. Um, and you can, it just kind of worked out that there was a storm coming in, creating these dark clouds in the, in the sky, which really pops, uh, pops the mountain line off of the, off of the page, which is quite nice. Yeah, certainly is. So is this a DSLR camera trap? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it, you know, it's funny because if, if people are interested in camera trapping, you don't have to use the latest and greatest equipment. This is a taken on a Canon 30D, which is an eight megapixel camera from 2006. And this image is still used all the time professionally, you know, in magazines or in advertisement campaigns. Uh, especially because because the camera is still you're basically setting up this little studio in nature where you don't need to have a super high frame rate uh you don't even necessarily need to have high iso performance so older cameras are kind of your best tool for camera trapping what what lens were you using do you remember yeah so i always use a 10 to 22 now it is on a crop body so it's more like a 16 to like 30, 32, 34, something like that. Um, 
but that's the whole point with camera trapping, which is nice, is that you can show the animal in its landscape. You know, in wildlife photography, we often work with these super telephoto lenses, 500 millimeters, 600 millimeters, which really flattens the image. It separates the cat from the background, which isn't a bad thing. It's just a very different look. So by by using a super wide angle lens, you get to show the animal within its landscape and, and create more of an atmospheric environmental portrait of the cat. Either this cat was very close to your camera trap or you had to do some cropping here. I'm not sure which. So yeah, the way I, because I know exactly where the cat will be uh, when I set it up because of the beam and has to cross that beam to take the image. I don't crop after I, because I know exactly I, I tend to know how big the cat is. I, I know uh, where it's going to trigger the camera when it, so where it will be compositionally. So I um, so I set it up to to be exactly composed the way I want it because I have all the time in the world to set up the camera trap. The hard part is did I select the right spot for the animal to walk by? So I didn't have to crop this image. Okay, I mean it's amazingly sharp and. Uh... The cat's just very wonderfully positioned. So how, how, how do you uh, figure all that out? Yeah, so it's a little bit hard to see here, but there's this there's a little bit of a game trail, so an, anim, uh, an animal trail, basically. Between those two bushes, the cat was coming right. from the left, obviously, exactly where it's stepping there. So and animals tend to use a path of least resistance. They're not going to just walk through the these bushes here when it's super thick they could hurt their feet a little bit no they're going to walk through where you know it's rocky and they can easily step on so that was um so i knew this was going to be a good spot for an animal to come by the hard part is figuring out kind of the exposure is it going to come by during the day is it going to come by during the during the night time so you kind of have to you have to kind of make an estimate of where it's, what time is going to come by so you can expose for that time and then uh, let your flashes do the do the work of freezing the cat and filling in the filling in the uh, foreground uh, lighting okay yeah so you must have spent uh, quite a bit of time just figuring out where they were going to be huh yeah. So, you know, we talked about the research earlier. So one, you, you come into, once you've land, once you're on the ground, you have already all this ecological knowledge of what, what places will the cat generally like? Um, what things can you look out for once you're on the ground that can confirm that, that the animal is using that specific area. Um, and so that's, so that's the first part, but then it's, actual doing scouting and just running around, not running around, generally laboring around <laughs> hiking, uh, trying to find good spots. And so um, oftentimes, let's say I have a month long assignment, I'll walk around and hike around for the first week, just trying to find a good spot to put up the camera traps. Um, because there's no point putting up a camera trap for for a whole month or three weeks when, uh, when it's not a good spot and, and because no animal will walk by. So it's worth spending the time and figuring out, okay, I think this is, is a good place for the camera trap, um, with a high chance of the animal of an animal coming by. And then, uh, like I said, uh, once you're, once you figured that out, I tend to spend between anywhere between two and four hours setting up one camera trap because you have to really nail everything. You have to put the uh, box, the, the triggers, so the transmitter and receiver just in the right position for the animal to be in the right pos position compositionally, it can't be seen. You have to bury the cables that go from the trigger to the camera because the rodents like to chew them. You have to, uh, you have to position the flashes in a way where you, the shadows are the way you want them to be. Um, so it can take, you know, it takes a significant amount of time because you just, um, you just want to make sure it's all right. Because once you leave it, you can't adjust it, right? You're, you're not going to, until you come back to check the camera trap, you have no way of changing the exposure or changing the flash power or moving the triggers. Once it's set up, it's set up and that's it. Are you shooting in manual mode? 
it, it depends, but um, generally I'm shooting in manual mode and I expose the camera. Uh, you know, I'm setting the camera trap up during the brightest part of the day. So, and then I'll underexpose the, the like I said, the, uh, the back, uh, underexpose the overall exposure, which is under, going to underexpose the background and I fill in the foreground with flashes. And then what happens is, since I'm shooting in manual, obviously I'm not, I can't adjust the exposure, but since I'm setting up during the brightest part of the day, I'm not worried about uh, it overexposing because it's only going to get darker. And what tends to happen then, or not tends to, what will always happen is the background as it, as the day progresses and gets, as there's less light and as it turns into darkness, the background is just going to fade from what I've properly exposed for during the, the brightest part of the day to a black as it goes into nighttime. So this shot was probably, you know, at sunset uh, or around sunset where the, the background is still nicely exposed. If it, if the cat had come by a couple of hours later, the foreground would still probably be exposed, but the sky and even the rock formation in the background would already be black because there's just no light. Um, the flashes can't reach that far, obviously. Yeah. So uh, in order to find these spots, do you hire a local guide or? So uh, I almost always work with biologists. That's the really, really important thing for me. I um, mo my, Most of my work would just not be possible without biologists who, who've worked in this area all of their lives. They know it like the back of their hands. Uh, they will have a very good idea where there might be some really good spots for me to set up. So, um, so they don't tend to be guides. They tend to be biologists. Guides would also be another great option though. Um, but because my assignments is generally through the biologists or through the conservation or organizations that the biologists work for, they ju just tend to be my local um, resource. Okay. Yeah. So. Um... How do you manage working with biologists? Because a lot of times they, or at least the ones I've uh, met or tried to meet, uh, weren't uh, real excited about working with a photographer. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that doesn't surprise me. In the end, you know, like I think one wildlife photographers uh, can have a kind of crappy reputation because we can be quite demanding. I think uh, the most important thing for me is that I. Um, I give back, right? It's not just about me coming there and getting a photograph. No, it's uh, the whole reason why I'm there is because I want to further conservation of these wildcats and the ecosystems that they live in. So um, by, I'm like, uh, I want to do that. And that's generally what the biologist also cares about. But, but more specifically, you know, I'll be like, okay, let's, um, you know, I'll give you the photographs um, that I take so you can use them for your presentations, for your grant writing, for your scientific articles. And um, and I would also photograph their work. I photograph, um, you know, whether they're camera trapping or collaring, whatever they're doing, I, I take photos of that. So they have those images, which are really useful for them and they never have high quality shots for them. So, and it just come. you have to approach them from a place of what can you do for them, not what, what can they do for you. Yeah, good advice. So uh, you also, I would assume, uh, frankly, frequently uh, encounter a language barrier as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, um, you know, it's my first assignment was to Yemen uh, during Arab Spring, which made things a little very dangerous but um i spoke you know i i spoke three words of arabic it was like hello and thank you basically um and so that was a quite a challenge um trying to communicate well you know what was even just what was going on on a daily basis but you you tend to just get really good at hand signals um and um and you just get you just figure it out i mean I know that can be kind of so prohibitive prohibitive about traveling is, oh, I don't speak the language, but if you, you know, if you're just kind of 
you're both passionate people uh, trying to do the same thing. You'll figure it out how to make it work. But the hand signals have come in very handy or I tend to make these one word sentences, you know, I'll be like eat <laughs> or food. That, that's, that's pretty obvious that it's like, Oh, can we eat? Um, or like stop meaning like, can we rest kind of thing? So it's like, you should just start picking up these one, uh, these very important words, very simple. You don't have complex conversations with biologists, sadly, but um, yeah, that's kind of how I've made it work. Uh -huh. Okay. So this is a sun clouded leopard that I photographed in Borneo. Uh -huh. And I think I saw somewhere that this was the only photograph in existence of a. So uh, yeah, the, the the that's the bay cat, which I uh, I'm not sure if I sent it to you, but um, there's very few shots of this cat. There's you know less than less than 15 photographs of this cat in the world. Wow. Yeah. And this is a great one. You yes. have uh, you have that photo trapping uh down pad it looks like i mean with camera trapping it's um it's always an evolving thing which is what i partially love is that i'm always learning more but uh yeah i mean i've done it long enough where i feel quite comfortable um with any situation now rainforests are actually a little bit easier for camera trapping because the light levels just don't actually change that much between noontime and even nighttime just because less you know like one percent or less than that reach the forest floor at any given time even during the middle of the day so your exposure is always kind of the same because you're always kind of starting from this very dark um point so uh you know, here again, there's a there's a trail that the camp that the cat is walking on, and um, super wide angle lens again, 10 to 22, probably closer to 10 millimeters than 22, and uh, yeah, two flashes, one to to really illuminate the cat from coming from the top right, and then a uh, I think another higher one to really illuminate some of that background because part of what I always want to show is the habitat that the cat lives in and um and here's this very dense jungle of borneo which are you know like i mentioned earlier it's an incredible incredible place that is just filled with biodiversity the the blue um the little blue point in its eyes is a is a, an, an injury an eye injury it has to stand but it obviously doesn't seem to affect it it's quite healthy otherwise yeah, the lighting, uh, despite being flash, looks very natural. I would have to say. Yeah, it's um, you know again, it, I know flash can be really intimidating for people who just haven't used it uh, in the past. But the way I, I set these things up is, you know, I set set up the camera, I, I expose, like I said, for the background, making sure I don't blow out any highlights in the back, and then. I just set up one flash at a time. I'll set up the main flash to illuminate, you know, the back, some of the background and kind of the overall scene. I, I walk through the camera or crawl through the camera like the cat would, see where the shadows fall and, and see how I need to put in the second flash um, to, to, to create the, um, the light and shadows that I want. And then in terms of, you know, you were saying it looks natural, that just comes down to how much flash power you put out. The disadvantage with camera traps is that, that you cannot use ETTL. Um, so you, you, the flashes won't adjust their power output based on your exposure. So you have to dial in a certain power output to begin with. And so you just need to make sure that that isn't ever overpowering and, and looks unnatural. Looks like a little kitty cat, but it's not, of course. It does look like a small domestic cat, yeah. This cat is actually one of the smallest cats in the world. At full grown size, it's about four pounds, and that's the males. The females are even smaller than that. They're about three pounds. When I first saw this cat, I thought it was a... Because th these cats I actually got to see in person. I didn't just have to use camera traps. I thought it was a rat. It was so small. And um, no, because these guys are just tiny there. They, uh, they live in Southern Africa. They, they feed on songbirds and small rodents, mice and stuff like that. 
And as you can see, they like even during the daytime, they sleep in these termite mounds or they sleep in, in uh, grounds, uh, underground holes created by, by rabbits. But um, so this, this cat's just emerging from its daytime sleeping place to, uh, to start hunting during the night. Is this in Kruger or? No, this is, uh, it's more in Western South, South Africa. It's, it's a, in a place called Ben Fontaine Nature Reserve. It's in, it's close to the Kalahari, basically. It's, it's a much drier landscape. Um, if, you, if you would be able to see the background, and this is kind of what we were talking about earlier about letting the night sky go to darkness um, with a manual exposure is, you would not see any trees. It's basically all this like very grassy, flat desert type habitat. Who funds all this travel for you? Are, are you self-funded or you? Yeah, so most of, um, so for my work, it's, it's, I'm always basically hired by somebody else. Um, to be honest, I couldn't afford to go uh, to all of these places by myself. But um, yeah, basically conservation organizations hire me to get these photographs of these very hard to photograph species. You know, it'd be much easier for them if a thousand photographs of these cats would already exist and they could just uh, license those photographs from the photographers directly. But a lot of times there's just no good photographs of these cats. So, um, so that's why I get hired to bring my camera traps, which you know, as a process in itself, in terms of one acquiring the photo, uh, the camera traps or building them, building them is what I tend to do. Um, that uh, um, to to then travel to location with all of this gear and then setting it up and, and, and getting an exposure that works for for uh, for the for the shot you're trying to get and the landscape you're working in and the light conditions that you're working in and the cat you're working with. So I do about, I would say seven or eight trips a year. Uh, they range anywhere from two weeks to six weeks. So I'm on the road most of the time. Um, and then one of those trips I'll fund myself kind of for a passion project, but the rest of the time I'm being hired by conservation organizations but or by magazines sometimes by companies but it's really mostly conservation organizations or magazines do they have big budgets for this or you... <laughs> no these are tiny budgets which is why uh what which is why you know it basically pays me to get there and it puts a little money in my pocket but it's not a lot and so to kind of make up for the for the money, I obviously need to just pay my bills and, and, and put food in my stomach. I always, so let's say I get hired by a conservation organization and they're like, okay, you get, need to photograph these black footed cats and you need to photograph the work we're doing. So that's job one. Job two for me, which I can do at the same time, is, is um, build a story, you know, figure out what the story is surrounding these cats. So for these cats, the story is that that um, they're they're benefiting from living on farmland because um, because farmers keep out bigger predators from their from their farms because they're worried about their livestock. So these cats actually do better because there's no big predators that could eat them. So that was kind of the story around this this cat. If I just focus on what the conservation organization wanted me to do, that would have been fine, but it wouldn't have paid uh, me nearly enough to, to just sustain myself. So I, I photographed the story um, with, around the farmers and the cats, and then I can sell that to a magazine and, uh, and make up some money through licensing, basically. Okay. Sounds like a hard way to make a living. It's an extremely hard way to make a living. It's not, uh, you don't do this. No, I would say nobody does this for the money. I definitely don't do it for the money. You know, for me, again, I, I just have an extreme love for these cats and I want other people to know about them and, and I just care about their conservation. And this is, this is how I can help 
with their conservation is through my photography. That's that's the skill I have, but I don't. Yeah, money is not the is not the driving force. Uh, I just make enough to uh, to uh, to sustain myself and to keep doing this. I, I mean, you can tell from my background, I, I'm pretty minimalist. Not granted, I I just moved into this space, but uh, I, I live a pretty simple life. I uh, you know I don't tend to buy too many things because I don't feel like I need them anyways. And plus I'm on the road almost all the time anyways. And it's what I love. I get to, I get to travel the world. I get to see these amazing cats. I get to meet amazing people, the biologists I work with or conservationists and um, ex have amazing experience that is that I wouldn't otherwise get to have. Not as glamorous a life as it sounds like though, huh? No, it is not like, I mean, you know, when I put, when I worked in Kyrgyzstan, I was sleeping at 10,000 feet in a sleeping in a zero degree sleeping bag that was tucked into a negative 29 degree sleeping bag because that's what it was necessary to just make it through the night because it was so cold. My water, my drinking water would freeze every night um, just from the extreme cold coldness. And, um, you know, it's, it's really funny because I photographed uh, bobcats in the U.S. the other day for an assignment, and I actually had, uh, you know, I lived in a in a permanent structure. It was a it was a small house, and I, I was so excited to to uh, have the luxury of four four permanent walls. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's definitely not glamorous. You know, you you don't tend to eat like very extravagant meals. They're very simple rice and beans kind of meals, but uh but all those things are like minor inconveniences when, when you get to see this amazing stuff and, and, and just be in that landscape. I mean, in Kyrgyzstan, you know, I was four hour, uh, uh, I had a four hour horse ride from the closest road. That's where my base camp was. So I was like alone in this extreme wilderness. And it was just amazing to, to have the privilege of getting to see that place and, and be in that space for for six weeks so um yeah so snow leopards you know I, I do a lot of my work on these small cats but sometimes i get a I, um i do often get work for these big cats too like snow leopards which we all know but if you look for photographs for snow leopards on the internet 99% of what you're going to get are either taken at zoos or at game farms. Game farms are something I strongly, strongly, strongly disagree with. Uh, I think it's total animal abuse. Um, but, but, um, but there's a reason. Snow leopards are really, really hard to photograph in the wild. They're called the ghosts of the mountains. And for a good reason, because they are just extremely elusive. I, I, um, I was on assignment and uh, I went to Panthera and um, for four weeks, I didn't get a single photograph. You know, I failed. I, I returned home without a single photograph of this cat. Um, luckily enough, the client understood how elusive they are and they sent me back for uh, an additional six weeks. So I spent uh, an entirety of 10 weeks to look for, for snow leopards. And so this brought me to Kyrgyzstan. Um, base camp was actually at the bottom of that snow covered peak you see in the background there. That's where I would sleep. And then I would walk all these different valleys and ridgelines and mountains to find a good spot for a camera trap. And I thought this was one of them because there's a little game trail here that the snow leopard is on. And uh, about 50 yards behind me was a boulder that snow, snow leopards like to cheek rub and, and scent mark. And so this was one of those things where you, knowing the ecological knowledge of snow leopards and how they like to mark their territory um, and, and finding that rock, you could actually smell their, the snow leopards urine from, you know, from the past when they've marked that spot before, you can smell it on the rock and the rock was worn smooth from them continuously like generations and generations rubbing this this rock for with their cheeks you know and so i knew that this would be a good spot um 
then I aim the camera based on the composition I want it. The, the, um, the triggers are behind each of these boulders. And, um, and I was a little lucky because what I didn't expect is for the snow leopard to have swam through the river. You can tell it's wet. Um, it's very wet, but, real, but its head is actually dry because it kept it above the water because it swam across this cold, cold river. This river is so cold, there would be ice chunks floating down it. And um, so I had obviously just crossed the river uh, a, few, a few seconds or a few minutes before it came up this game trail and then triggered my camera trap. Is this a uh, subspecies of the pictures I've seen before or from Nepal, I think, and uh, right. This yeah, one? so so most photographs of snow leopards are taken in India, in Ladakh, in northern India. That's when, like, if you wanted to go on a photo tour and look for snow leopards, that's where you would go. You you don't the you never see them from a close distance. Uh, the snow leopards are generally at least a hundred, maybe two hundred yards away. And um, if not like a mile away and you're just looking at them through a scope, which is still an amazing experience, obviously. But, uh, but these guys, um, and I wouldn't have seen them either. This is obviously taken with a camera trap. You can see that from the very three-dimensional view you get from a wide angle lens. Um, these guys are the same um, subspecies. Cat taxonomy changes all the time. so. And there's, I think there's two, yeah, there's now two subspecies recognized and I, they may or may not be the same as the Indian ones. I'm actually not sure right now. Um, but more importantly is that snow leopards as a total population are, um, you know, they're threatened, their population is going down partially due to climate change. And um, that's the important thing to, to talk about these guys is that, is that the numbers are going down and we can definitely do something about it by, by changing our lifestyles, um, which will save a cat halfway around the world if you live in the US. Um, but so that's kind of the stories that I tend to focus on and, and talking about the threats and how we can help them, these cats. So what percentage of your work is with camera traps versus uh, you know having a camera on a tripod say? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, that's kind of a little bit hard to answer. I, I, I would need to break it down a bit more. I would say that for my cat, my specifically the photos I have of cats, I would say is probably six, 60, 65 percent camera traps. The rest is me being out with a, like you said, with a camera on a tripod. But while I'm putting out camera traps in a landscape like this, it's not like I'm just sitting around. So I'm either uh, I'm still photographing a bunch. I'm photographing the researchers. I'm photographing the threats. I'm photographing the landscape. So either you, you know, even using drones or or just um, having a camera on a tripod, that kind of a thing. So this is constant. You're you're working, you know, from sunrise to sunset, no matter if you're using camera traps or not. It, during the middle of the day, that's kind of when you go and check your camera traps because the light's just not great. Um, and make sure they're working, but at sunrise and sunset, you're still shooting other stuff. And maybe you're sitting in blinds too. So sometimes what I would do is, or I do this a lot actually, is where I'll set up all my camera traps in the beginning of the assignment. And then I, I look for spots that I would place a camera trap at where I'm thinking a cat might come by. And then I'll set up a blind and that's where I'm hanging out, you know, all the time from sunrise, from pre-sunrise to post-sunset hoping a cat will come by. Um, but, uh, you know, those are, so those are very long days, but it's two different techniques of trying to get of shots of these cats. Okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I, uh, I admire your dedication and uh, as well as your wonderful photos. So uh, thanks for sharing those with us. And yeah, thanks Kirby, thanks for, uh, Thanks for allowing me to share them and, and hopefully, you know, this, they are interesting to your, to your audience and both photographically and as well subject wise. I mean, there's so many cool cats out there that, uh, 
that I just want people to know about. Yeah, you bet. I, uh, I gotta believe a lot of people find this uh, fascinating as I do. Yeah. So uh, tell everyone where they can find your work and find you and everything you do. I would say the best place to, to follow me and see what's going on or to even get in touch with me is on Instagram. My username for that is Puma Picks. So Puma, like the animal, P-U-M-A, and then P-I-X. All, that's all one word. Um, so you can follow me there. If you, know, if, if you have any photographers who are interested in wildcats and want to photograph them, I actually also run photo tours for wildcats, the ones that are more easily seen. Um, so anything from pumas in Chile to uh, the big cats of Africa, um, even cats in Borneo, I, I run a tour there and that's Cat Expeditions and that's also on Instagram or catexpeditions.com would be the website for that, for that photo tour company that I've started. How's that going for you? It's going well. I mean, I, I started it during COVID, so that was a you know very smart business move. But <laughs> um, but at the same time, it kind of allowed me to to um, you know people follow me per you know on my on my Instagram account already for the cats, and so it wasn't that hard of a sell to bring them over to cat expeditions as well because um, because I I want to share these cats with people, and uh, they're so amazing, and they're. All of my tours are, they have some kind of conservation angle associated with them. So for example, we go to see the Iberian lynx, the most endangered cat in the world in Spain. And uh, we build, we spend a morning building um, a rabbit warren, which is basically a rabbit home, um, which will help increase the rabbit numbers, which is what the, what the uh, lynx eat. And so it helps the lynx in the long term. So it's a, it's a combination of putting people in the best place to photograph these cats. And um, we've always had multiple Iberian links on every tour I've run and, um, and helping out with their conservation. Great. Sounds great. I'll yeah. put, put links to all that stuff on the show notes. So yeah, thanks for me. Well, each episode is published on the 15th and 30th of the month. Uh, We'll be back again on September 15th with a new episode. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon.